This is the Rich Dad Radio Show. The good news and bad news about money. Here's Robert Kiyosaki. Hello, 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 Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. And uh, we have a very, very exciting guest today. He's uh, one of the smartest guys I know. I call him the best looking guy in crypto, better looking than Max Kaiser. <laughs> but it's for all you Bitcoin and crypto fanatics out there, this is your show. But it's also for you old guys, you Peter Schiff fans, you know, who can't really seem to get it. You know, like Schiff's always, always yelling about Bitcoin and crypto and, and then, you know, the, the Bitcoin guys attack him. And to me, it's silly. It's, all, all that counts to me is how much have you got? And it's not what's the price. How many ounces of silver do you have? How many ounces of gold do you have? And how many Bitcoin or Ethereum or whatever it is? That's all that counts to me. You know, whether it was right or wrong, we'll, we'll discuss that. But why argue about it? So we have our very special guest, Robert Breedlove. He's a good friend of my other friend, Anthony Pompliano. And the thing about being an old guy is I learned from the young guys because this, this we've never been here before. We're on the edge of something so effing big that nobody knows where we're going. So welcome back to the program, Mr. Breedlove. And uh, we're saying the same thing. It's going to be an exciting 10 years, huh? Yes, it's going to be exciting, uh, potentially painful, if you're not positioned correctly, and transformative. And, and thank you, Robert, for having me back. I'm glad to be here. Oh, no, I, I, I'm just, I'm, I'm almost blown away at how smart you young guys are. I, I used to hope when I got to be an old guy, I'd be the smart guy, but now I'm the old guy. I'm still the old stupid guy. But anyway, <laughs> it's, things are changing so fast. Hey, quick, give us a, back, give us a bit of your background, Mr. Breedlove, Robert. Yeah, sure. So um, I have my undergraduate master's degree in accounting and finance. Um, I was a certified public accountant for a number of years, um, focusing on tax strategy for investment partnerships and high net worth individuals. Uh, I then shifted gears and was pretty much a career CFO, uh, mostly focused in tech, and then got involved in crypto assets in 2014, um, made it professional in 2017. And I've been traveling down the proverbial Bitcoin rabbit hole ever since, studying monetary history, government, politics, um, basically exclusively for the past four years. And the reason your you know, uh, background is important is because accountancy is everything to me. You know, that's Rich Dad Porter is a book on accounting. Yeah. Assets, liabilities, income expenses, you know, that's, that's all it is, taxes. Yeah. And most people don't know much about it. So, yeah, it's, it's incredible. Um, and I think today, you know, what the, the real message I'm trying to get across today is people, we've been conditioned to think inflation is not that big of a deal. And I think when you really consider economics from first principles, you'll come to see inflation as it's a coercive, thieving, and a moral force. And it's very simply just the stealing of wealth by yep. those who can print money <clears throat> from those who cannot print money. And as the old saying goes, inflation is the surest way to fertilize the rich man's field with the sweat of the poor man's brow. Amen. And then what a lot of people don't know when I talk about financial education, I, you know, I go back to Gresham's law. And Gresham's law says when bad money enters, good money goes into hiding. Mm -hmm. And so this has gone on throughout history. The Romans did it, the Germans did it, Zimbabwe did it, Venezuela is doing it. It's Gresham's law. When you have fake money enter the system, which would happen in 1971 when Nixon took the dollar off the gold standard, Gresham's law took effect. And good money, i.e. gold and silver, went into hiding. And I've been yeah. in gold, I've been in silver since 1964 and gold since 1972. And that's, I don't save dollars because I, I support Gresham's law. Remember, Hitler came to power because of Gresham's law. Mm -hmm. When in World War I, they messed with the Reichsmark, the German currency after World War I. Right. So here we are again today. And they're still doing the same old thing. I mean, Biden's going to print what, I think five trillion this year. Twenty, this is twenty twenty one, and people are still working for the dollar. I mean, as a CPA and a finance guy working with high net worth individuals, what do you say to people right now who are trying to save U.S. dollars? <laughs> well, you know, it's funny you brought up Gresham's law, which is a 
very true law that bad money chases good money out of circulation. People are smart. People save good money and they spend bad money, right? It's just right. It's incentives. There's another law actually uh, related to bad money itself and it's, it's related to inflation. So inflation progresses according to the law of accelerating issue and depreciation. Well, what was that again? It might have an old guy. I'm a Biden effect here. You're going to get a little slower. The, the law of accelerating issuance and depreciation. So I'll, I'll work through it a little bit. And this is a law that works as surely as gravity. We've seen it happen many times throughout history. So for a monetary authority, it's typically easier to resist the first issuance or the first expansion of the money supply. But once they start engaging in inflation, the second issuance or the second expansion becomes much more difficult to resist. And by the third, fourth, and fifth, it's basically inevitable. They're just going to respond with more and more inflation. So fiat currency itself, it is actually born by borrowing. So right. systemically, the supply of dollars can never be sufficient to satisfy the debts that it creates. So it's, it's, it's incentivizing the creation of debt from the outset. And the way the money, with being a CPA, the reason that works is the way they get the money back is via taxation. Yeah, and, and seniorage, frankly. Right. They're buying government treasuries, right? The Fed's buying government treasuries, so they're paying yeah. at interest. Um, it, there's never, the, the point of the story is there's never enough dollars in the system to satisfy the debt it creates. It's a self-annihilating system. Well, it's also Tr Triffin's dilemma because yes. you, could you could never ever fix it. It would right. always go farther and further and further into debt. Right, so the, the, the inflation that accelerates and gets worse over time, it cannot, you can't turn, you can't put the toothpaste back in the tube, as you might say. And there's very simple consequences on market actors are when money holds value, people save. When money loses value, people go into debt or if you're a corporation, you buy back your shares or you, get, you engage in other uh, risky activities to try and outperform inflation. So it creates this artificial hurdle rate for all market actors. And that's what we're steeped in today. We are far down that road. And that's what I'd like to talk about is, you know, Bitcoin and the next 10 years of money. Right. And so the reason I love having on the program is because you have the financial depth from traditional finance but to go into Bitcoin, which is the future, I'm going to talk about the next 10 years. And, and surprisingly, one of the reasons I created the Rich Dad Company was because of Gresham's Law. Mm -hmm. You know, the bad money chases out good money, or good money goes into hiding. I never saw Bitcoin. And now I'm going, holy moly, what's going to happen next, you know? So what do you think is going to happen next, Mr. Breedlove? Yeah, you know, no one saw Bitcoin coming. No one had any expectation of gold could be disrupted um, or even have a competitor for that matter. So it's very interesting times we live in. But I think the US in 2021 is on equivalent monetary footing to France in 1791. Okay. And to put a few numbers to this, so after expanding, France had been expanding its money supply roughly 300% in the years leading up to 1791. They then settled into an annual expansion of 18% per year in 1792. Okay. So I'm gonna walk you through the history of France and I'll tie it back to the US. So 1792, France is expanding 18% a year. They double their money supply expansion again to 35% in 1794. Again, the law of accelerating issuance and depreciation. The more money they printed, the more money they had to print to keep the, the thing going. Then in 1795, France quadrupled their money supply expansion rate of 145% per year. And finally, in 1796, the printing press, where they're actually creating the currency, the, the assignments, was publicly broken and burned. So they <laughs> proved that they would not print anymore. And the currency had fallen to zero, basically. And so in that six-year period, 1790 to 1796, France expanded its money supply 100x and fully depreciated its currency. So... If we use that as kind of a framing, and that there's many historical examples, but I just picked one um, that, that uh, conveys the law of accelerating issuance and depreciation to tie that to the US. In the US today, from 2001 to 2020, we've expanded our money supply roughly 250%. So just a little bit less than France did. 
And recently in 2020, we've started expanding our money supply at about 18% per year. Now that's a conservative estimate. Uh, the actual numbers are roughly 25%, but I'm just going to go with 18 uh, to be conservative. So we're tracking right on the numbers. Tracking right on the numbers. And so if we, use, if we again, looking at the law of accelerating issuance and depreciation, I would predict that by the year 2024, we will be forced to double that issuance rate again. So from 18% to 35%. And as you alluded to earlier, Biden is already talking about five and $10 trillion stimulus packages. That would be well in excess of 35% expansion. Um, so I think that will happen again. And then by the year 2030, I would expect that we have to quadruple that rate again, uh, reaching a monetary expansion rate in the US of 145% annually. By that time, so if, that, if those rates hold uh, between now and 2030, where we increase to 35% in 2024 and 145% in 2030, the total US M2 money supply will have expanded from today it's around 20 trillion, it will expand 25X to $500 trillion. That's what I think is gonna happen in the next decade in the US money supply. And then if we look abroad, I think what you're gonna have is just a wave of smaller currency collapses, smaller sovereigns with weaker currencies, they will just be collapsing stronger currencies like the dollar, um, like, like the, the Chinese yuan as well. And by the end of this decade, I would expect that the, the total purchasing power of the dollar globally today is about, it represents about 20%. So global M2 is roughly 100 trillion, the dollar is about 20 trillion. So it represents 20% of global purchasing power. I think it will double. So as some of these currencies collapse, they collapse into the dollar. So by the end of the decade, the year 2030, I would expect the US to have about 40%, US dollar to have about 40% of global purchasing power. So if the dollar is at a $500 trillion market cap and it represents 40% of global M2, that means the global money supply is expanded to $1.25 quadrillion. That is $1,250 trillion, which is about 12X what it is today. So that sounds like the derivatives market to me, which is a completely BS market. But we'll come back when, you know, the People love numbers and all this, but one of the reasons uh, people want to listen to you right now is everybody wants to know in 2031, what is your prediction for the price of Bitcoin? That is the only thing that people really care about right now. So they're going to make a decision whether they buy or not, not on France, not on anything like this, but what does Robert Breed love to see the future given if history tracks, which it seems to be tracking, what will the price of Bitcoin be in 2031, which is 10 years? We'll be right back. Welcome back, Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show. Good news and bad news about money. You can listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes or Android and YouTube. And then please leave a review whenever you listen. All of our programs are archived at richdadradio.com. We archive them because we don't, we're an education company. We make no recommendations. We're purely educational. Anything we say, take with a grain of salt. We don't recommend anything. And the most important thing is if you listen to this program again, you'll learn twice as much because repetition is how we learn. That's how you get to become a better golfer. Repeat, keep, making, keep repeating. But also listen to this with friends, family, and business associates, especially those out there who are saving their stimulus check and hoping this will save them from what's coming down the road because our guest today is, is a friend of the Rich Dad Company, Rich Dad Radio, Robert Breedlove, and he's a founder and CEO and CIO of Parallax Digital. He's not only a CPA, but he's also an expert on this thing called Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies. And he's talking about what's gonna happen in the next 10 years with the US dollar, gold, silver, but most importantly, Bitcoin. So before we go on, you know, Robert, Robert was talking about something about which is beyond my head, but we had a good friend, his name is Philip Haslund, he's from South Africa. He wrote the book, the, um, How Current, When Currency Destroys Nations. And he was writing about the fall of Zimbabwe. 
And he's saying exactly the same thing Robert Breedlove is saying. He calls it the seven falls. And the seven falls is once a country like Zimbabwe starts to print money, you take the first jump and you can't go back up. Then you take the next jump and there's four more falls to go and you keep jumping. And so that's what Robert Breedlove's talking about in this program here is America's already gone down that road. We, <laughs> we took a big jump in 2021. This is March, 2021. And we're going to keep jumping. <laughs> so, that, so the question is, Mr. Breedlove, what, what do you see happening in the future? I mean, we, we have 20, 20, 2031 coming and everybody was going to hold it to the last, but what do you think the future price of Bitcoin might be in 2031, but keep going into your analysis of why we have to keep jumping. Absolutely. Yeah, there's an old saying that says it's easier, it's harder to stop halfway downhill <laughs> than to just not go initially. And I think that's what inflation yeah. is. Yeah. And this law that we mentioned, this law of accelerating issuance and depreciation related to currency, this is an ancient law. I mean, it's been written about for hundreds and hundreds of years. This is not uh, a joke. This is not something I made up. This is something you can find everywhere that this pattern repeats. Once countries start down this path, it's, uh, it's very bad and it's, and it's inescapable. You can't turn back. So going into 2031, which as we left off earlier, uh, I would expect the U.S. money supply to expand from 20 trillion ish today to about 500 trillion in the next 10 years. I expect global M2 to uh, expand roughly 12x from around 100 trillion to about 1250 trillion, 1.25 quadrillion. Uh, and the difference there is that a lot of the weaker international currencies will have collapsed into the dollar, so the dollar will actually have grown in purchasing power overall. And I think by this time, so going into 2031, let's say, that Bitcoin will have continued its growth trajectory. It will have played out another one of these price cycles. Possibly uh, its price cycle will have broken and it just gone into a long, slow grind upwards as people realize it's a game of accumulation. And I think Bitcoin by this time will have reached about 20% of global purchasing power. So this would imply Bitcoin's market cap in 2031 dollars to be about $250 trillion. So that's about one fifth of global M2 stored in Bitcoin. Now, accounting for inflation, that means Bitcoin's market cap in today's dollars would be about 20 trillion. So in 2031 dollars, and this is a very bright line to distinguish, I think Bitcoin by the year 2031 will be north of $12.5 million per Bitcoin. Jesus. But and a half million per coin. Twelve and a half million. But adjusting for inflation, it will only feel like north of one one million dollars per Bitcoin in 2021 dollars because the dollar will have lost so much of its value by then. Twelve and a half million dollars will spend like one million dollars. So that's my prediction for by 2031. And then that's gonna clearly have some big impact on fiat currencies, including the dollar. Well, again, that goes back to Gresham's law is that the more fake money they, what, what you're talking about is when they, in, they increase M2 and M3 and all of those stuff they, they taught me in economics, which I forgot, mm. it's just printing more money. That's all they're doing. Right. And so that's what gives Bitcoin and the blockchain chain technology so much more credibility than the central bank money, fake money, I call it. That's right. Um, it, it's so, as I've said in the past episode with you, actually, it's a pyramid scheme. Oh, God, yes. When we say printing money, you're not actually creating any new wealth or value. No. You're just shifting the claims on existing capital. And you're stealing from those that are dependent on the dollar to hold its value, which are the poor, those living on fixed income, retirees, pensioners. You're stealing from the most economically vulnerable. Right. And giving to those with access uh, to the freshly printed money. Right. And look, this is why you know, my wife and I started the Rich Dad Companies. We need financial education. You know, just as simple as Gresham's Law, fake money drives out good money. You know what I mean? You have bad money. And our Federal Reserve Bank, the smartest guys on earth, 
you know, don't fight the Fed, they're printing trillions. Yeah. And, and we have millions of Americans and people all over the w- world waiting for the stimulus check. We're going to crush them. I mean, yeah. from, as from your financial background, in my opinion, every time we print money, we just create more poor people. I mean, that's poor. what we're doing. Well, what do you have to say about that? I mean, we're just creating poor people. You're 100% correct. And the fact that Jerome Powell can go on national television and say that there's no causation between monetary policy and wealth disparity is a testament to the times we're living in. I mean, we are drowning in deception in this world. It's just the whole world, the whole thing's built on lies. And I would argue, and I think many Bitcoiners would argue, it, all, it starts and ends with the money. We have a lie built into our money, right? The paper was once redeemable for gold. That became a lie. Because the we paper, violated Gresham's law. We, we produced bad money. That's right. Throughout history, the Romans did it. Germans did it. Zimbabwe did it. Venezuela's doing it. Everybody's doing it. And now we have Bitcoin, blockchain, Ethereum. So that's why, that's why, you know, as an old guy, I've got to keep my mind open and I got to defend the old guy like Peter Schiff <laughs> who keeps going back and forth. I go, I just buy some stupid Bitcoin, Peter. Why argue? <laughs> yeah, it's when we corrupt and violate the trust fabric that right. connects us, which is money, society unravels. And that is, you know, we have... Lots of anecdotal evidence of that throughout history. Every time the currency collapses, the civilization collapses. So, and you know, I would argue that it's, you know, clearly I'm very focused on Bitcoin. I'm not, I don't advocate for other cryptocurrencies. I don't think Ethereum is gonna be a big deal um, or as big of a deal as, as Bitcoin. I think gold, it's a 5,000 year old technology will only be disrupted once. And that is by Bitcoin. And that's what we're going to see play out over the next 10 years. So with Bitcoin by 2031, north of $12.5 million per coin, it's equal to about 20% of the global purchasing power. So it's about half the dollar's value in total. But again, the dollar will have increased according to the law of accelerating issuance and depreciation. Its issuance rate will have increased, I'm predicting, to north of 145% by the early 2030s. This would be early stage hyperinflation. Uh, or you could say actually probably medium stage hyperinflation. Typically a currency won't last more than a few years um, under that, that well, growth. This, this is the infamous Weimar Republic, which led yeah. to the rise of Adolf Hitler. That's right. Every dictator, every internment camp, every world war in human history was funded by fiat currency. Right because those individuals were not limited to the bounds of their own balance sheet. They could use fiat currency to steal the savings from the entire society and just keep going to war until everyone's broke. That's like the story of my mother. She'd always say, how can I be broke? I still have checks. <laughs> so, let, so, let me, let, so let me take the old guy side, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna challenge you on this side. So as an old guy, I was just in uh, Park City the other day. Again, you know, this is March 2021 because the day everything's changing so quickly. Um, these guys came up to me and they were telling me about the new altcoins or something they're producing. And you know, when I talk to guys like you, they say, "Well, Bitcoin is the network." Well, just being an old guy, you know, the network is like McDonald's. What gives McDonald's power? Is there a franchise network? But there was also a blockbuster video that digital blew out of the water. You know, why why would you go to blockbuster where you can download digitally? So these young guys were coming up to me saying, oh, Bitcoin is trash because they're gonna start another currency. So being an old guy, how would you explain to me that idea? Because it's coming out of your head. It's not coming out of a gold mine or a silver mine, but by the way, Park City was a silver mine. So how couldn't somebody just create their own Bitcoin and their own network and just blow Bitcoin out of the water? So this is a nuanced answer to the question. Um, it's not a straightforward question to answer because many people think, oh, iPhone disrupted BlackBerry, Facebook disrupted MySpace, something can disrupt Bitcoin. 
the first answer would be money itself. Why is money as a network valued? And it turns out that there are properties to money, divisibility, durability, recognizability, portability, scarcity. And then the network that gets built up around that is valued based on how liquid it is uh, and, and what the network effects are. So how many people you can exchange with. This is uh, so, so, so let me give you the old guy's story. Okay. And it's like McDonald's. I can go into McDonald's here in Beijing and then get a big Mac and it tastes about the same. The French fries are about the same. That's the network or the, the effect and get that. That's what gives McDonald's its power. Yeah, I would say, I would modify it slightly and say, again, gold's a good analogy here. It's like, if I have a lot of gold, I know I can buy it or sell it on the market with least loss in price. Right. So it has a lot of saleability, a lot of marketability. It's, li it's liquid. People, there's demand all over the world for it. So new investors always prefer the most liquid money. Right. So it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, basically. It's the, the same reason, the argument I commonly make is the same quantifiable reasons we only have one analog gold we will only for those same reasons we will only have one digital gold and then again if you look at those properties of money that gold best satisfied historically divisibility durability recognizability portability scarcity bitcoin has essentially perfected them it's a pure digital asset so it's infinitely divisible it's stored in a distributed way so the information does not break down. This is something like the Bible, right? The Bible's outlasted empires because it's distributed information. It's infinitely portable because it's digital. You can move it at the speed of light. Uh, it's infinitely recognizable, meaning you can audit the total supply. You can run a node. You can verify the money supply. Anyone can do it anywhere for free. And then finally, it has perfect scarcity. Um, it's the first asset in human history that we know has an absolutely fixed supply and no one can change. Okay. So, so I'm, I'm going to play old guy again, Robert. Again, I'm in park city a couple of days ago and these guys are pitching me on why I should inv I don't I should have kept it. Cause I knew I was going to interview you and I should have got the name of their coin. They were pitching me. It says better than Bitcoin. Yeah. So being an old guy, I had no retort. I couldn't come back at them because I don't really know. So why couldn't somebody just create their own coins? I mean, so, aren't, aren't they going to? And they do. There's thousands of them out there. Um, because if you're trying to compete with Bitcoin directly as money, and it has perfected those five properties of money, there's essentially no design space left to introduce a feature that could disrupt Bitcoin. And it's, if there was, so first of all, wow. You're saying it all Satoshi or whoever he was locked it up tight? Well, digit, you know, once you digitize money, money's an informational instrument. It gains all of these advantages and right. the, the services it offers become, um, you know, as good as we can create. With, with so current. Are you saying it, it automatically gets stronger? Well, here's the thing. Assuming even if these guys are the next Einstein and they've figured out something else that money needs that none of us knew it needed, should they go into the market, they sell this coin, it starts to have some success. Bitcoin is still adaptive. It's open source technology. So if there's a feature they've developed that makes money better, which we don't know of one, again, Bitcoin can absorb that feature set. It's open source technology. It can still, it resists harmful changes, but it, it can uh, absorb useful changes, let's say. So this further insulates it. So it's adaptable, it's flexible, it'll change. It's a living money, right? Bitcoin too, the difficulty adjustment itself, the harder we try to mine Bitcoin, it actually adapts, it responds to human action and becomes more difficult to produce over time. That is the game. Is it's, um, it's the first money that's responsive to human action. Okay, being an old guy again, all right? So way back when, when, um the dot-com era came up, there was pets.com and there was Amazon. And again, an old guy like me didn't know the difference between pets.com and Amazon. So I invested in neither of them. So are you saying that Amazon just got more adaptive and stronger and blew pets.com out of the water? He, this is actually leads to another good point is that network effects themselves. So network effect, first of all, is a network becomes exponentially more valuable each new network participant then joins. So 
uh, one guy joins, but it becomes one to the power of whatever more valuable. So it's becoming exponentially more valuable per new participant. Network effects can have multiple sides too. So when we saw Facebook disrupt MySpace, they did that by introducing a superior value prop to just the user. Facebook and MySpace is a one-sided network effect. You look at something like Craigslist, this is a two-sided market. They have buyers and sellers in the marketplace. So they are more protected from disruption because to disrupt Craigslist, you need to introduce a better value prop for buyers and sellers simultaneously. Okay. Otherwise, nobody moves, right? And you can see this in Craigslist. It's kind of, it doesn't have a lot of innovation, but because of its early lead, it's still a, a fairly well-established network. If you look at Bitcoin through that lens, Bitcoin has a four-sided network effect. We have buyers in Bitcoin, we have sellers of Bitcoin, we have the miners, and then we have all the entrepreneurs building on top of and around it. So if you're gonna try and disrupt this network, you have to introduce a superior value proposition that Bitcoin can somehow not absorb. Again, it's open source software, it can absorb features that are useful. And you have to convince that this entire global network that's four-sided to move simultaneously. And the whole thing is centered on a trillion dollar asset now. Typically when these networks get above 100 billion, they become dominant. So Amazon, two-sided market, once it got above 100 billion in market cap, it became dominant. Um, we're, well, we're well past that with Bitcoin. And I don't think there's any disrupting it at this point. Well, being an old guy, you know, I just, I just look at Amazon, you know, could they have absorbed pets.com? Yeah, they could sell pets. They could sell anything they wanted to sell. Yeah, they do they now. Adapt. Oh, is, that, is, that, is that what you're saying Bitcoin is? No matter what somebody throws at it, it'll come up. If it's better, it'll adapt it anyway. That's right. That's what I'm saying. But you can't change the rules. You can only, right. it's there's an asymmetry in the governance mechanics that it can only absorb useful features, but it resists harmful changes. No one can go make more than 21 million Bitcoin. All right, you can't make that change, but you can make uh -huh. some positive change. So my final question is this, being an old game, I barely use my cell phone. Um, I, I, you know, I bought some Ethereum. What do you think about Ethereum? You know, I, Ethereum is actually what drew me into crypto assets originally. I was um, interested in the concept of smart contracts. But the way I've come to see the space is that there will be full consolidation at the base layer. I think everything will consolidate onto Bitcoin. And that all the experimentation and variation will be done at higher layers on top of Bitcoin. Whereas Ethereum is trying to be its own separate base layer. Um, and there's also a lot of questionable action from their development team. They've changed their goals a lot and shifted the goalposts. There was a big pre-mine on it. So there's a lot of, a lot of unfairness in, in Ethereum. And I don't expect that track record to improve anytime soon. So I would, I, typically encourage people new to the space to focus their attention and en energies on Bitcoin. I think you'll get the most bang for your buck in terms of uh, investing your time learning. And it's, um, and you know, in my opinion, it's going to capture the vast majority of the value in this wave of innovation. Um, and just to finish out what we were saying earlier, like we get into the early 2030s, I don't see the U S dollar surviving beyond 2035. Wow. But when it starts, accelerating at 145% per year, the US M2 money supply. Um, that's when I think hyper Bitcoinization, which is a term uh, many people in Bitcoin use to refer to Bitcoin absorbing all the, the uh, global monetary premium. I think that's gonna start to happen. And post hyper Bitcoinization, when Bitcoin becomes global based money, it will be valued at above $5 million per coin in 2021 dollars. So that's present day purchasing power. But after the dollar hyper inflates, there comes a point where the dollar value of Bitcoin no longer makes any sense. No one will even talk about the dollar value of Bitcoin. They'll just actually talk in sats. Which that's, is the that's, that's like Philip Haslam talking about the, the seven falls. Yeah. You're at the bottom of the falls, nobody cares. That's right. On. That, that, that's what happens to the Zimbabwe dollar. Nobody cares about it. That's right. It's like in Venezuela today, there's cash clogging the gutters in the streets. It's, it's meaningless, you know? So this is going to be the biggest disruptor in world history so far. I think we're going into the most transformative decade, certainly in monetary history, possibly in world history. Oh, um, yeah, I, definitely. 
I think we're transitioning from the industrial age into the digital age. Definitely. I believe COVID, there was already a lot of groundwork laid for that for the first 25 years of the internet, but I think COVID was a massive accelerant right. to the global adoption of digital technologies. And I think Bitcoin is the tip of the spear in this entire movement. Uh, it is the force separating money from state for the first time in history. And, um, you know, stands to be the most valuable asset you could ever own. So but while we end up, I'd like to have you give you a little plug for your, I mean, I really appreciate you coming on and sharing your knowledge and insights. Again, we, we don't make recommendations. We're not saying buy Bitcoin or gold, silver or <clears throat> Ethereum. But the purpose of the Rich Dad Company is to keep people's minds open. You know, just like when I was standing on the street corners of uh, Park City, these guys are pitching me a new bit, a new crypto. I have to stay with an open mind, not, not, but I had, I had the benefit of coming back down to, back down to Phoenix to talk to Robert Breedlove. So that's all we do. We keep an open mind, listen to what people have to say. So Robert, how do people stay in touch with you? How do they get more information from your, your work? Yeah, you can find me on Twitter. Uh, my last name is Breed Love, B R E E D L O V E. My Twitter handle is Breed Love 22. Um, I've got my DMs are open. I've got links to my website, my writing. Um, and then most recently, we've launched the What Is Money show, um, kind of taking after your footsteps, doing a little podcast Good. YouTube channel. Good. Uh, I named it the What Is Money show because I think that is the important question people need to ask themselves to get to the bottom of this rabbit hole. It's really sounds simple, but if you just keep asking yourself this question, I think it will uncover more and more truth. Well, Robert, uh, it's, it's Gresham's law. It's Gresham's law. Bad money chases out good money. That's right. And we've had, we're having a flood of bad money worldwide. Yes. Yes. So you need to be in gold. You need to be in Bitcoin. Um, and I, the only investment advice I do give is to just study this, study that question, study gold, study Bitcoin, and decide for yourself. I'm not here to sell you anything. I'm just here to warn you that we are going into completely uncharted territory. Correct. Yeah, currency inflation perspective. And inflation rips societies apart. Like I said, at the end of the, uh, the, end of the inflation in France, they publicly broke and burned the printing press. Um, there was recently a, I think the central bank was burned in Lebanon. I would expect to see more central banks burned in this decade. Um, I, agree with, I agree with you. And more government intervention. They're going to do, you know, because inflation creates all these shortages and problems uh, in the socioeconomic sphere and governments keep trying to step in to create other laws to try and to play whack-a-mole to solve this, that, and the other. And it just makes things worse. So I think this decade is going to be very choppy. So I just, you know, really encourage people to ask themselves that question and study for themselves. Well, historically, what happens when you print money, the poor get poor. That's right. And then you have hyperinflation, it gets worse. Then you have revolution. Yeah. And that's my concern. That's why I started the Rich Dad Company. We have to have financial education. So I really thank you for being a major contributor to our work and our information. And uh, please, everybody, check out Robert Breedlove. Thank you very much, Robert. Thank you, Robert. Really appreciate it. And we'll be right back for the final for the Rich Dad Radio Show. Thank you. Welcome back. Robert Kiyosaki, the Rich Dad Radio Show, the good news and bad news about money. Once again, listen to the Rich Dad Radio program anytime, anywhere on iTunes, Android, and YouTube. And please leave a review if you wish. All of our programs are archived at Rich Dad Radio. We archive them because we're purely educational. I invest in gold, silver, and Bitcoin and Ethereum, but we don't recommend it. We recommend you keep an open mind and listen. So we're a purely educational show. And very special thanks to Robert Breedlove, a friend of the Rich Dad Radio Company, simply because he's a young guy, I'm an old guy, and we need to keep open minds between the generations here. So anyway, it's been a fantastic program. I got a lot of my questions answered. And so Sarah, what did you think? Well, first, you know, it's so great to have people like him and Anthony Pompliano part of our kind of community. Because even Peter Schiff. And even Peter Schiff. Um, <laughs> pain in the butt. No, I, I love offering, you know, having them offer their perspectives. Yes. We're here to educate. And that's what I feel like this episode really did. I love that he 
gave his prediction for Bitcoin in 10 years. But what I love even more is he gave the reason behind it. Mm-hmm. He's not just one of these guys that's, you know, oh, because of the hype of the Bitcoin. He can provide historical data to support Correct. it. So that's why I really appreciate his in- input and uh, what he has to say. It was fantastic. The final, the final thing is, is that when I talk to young guys like this, they're all after the Bitcoin guys. They're all rebels, you know, and there's another economist named Schumpeter and Schumpeter said capitalism is creative destruction. So the capitalists are always going after the fat, the, the lazy, the incompetent and the fat, lazy, incompetent <laughs> are the people in the fed and the government right now they're, they're just fat, lazy and dumb and they're ripping off the people. So guys like Robert Breed love Max Kaiser and these guys and Anthony Pompliano, they come around, they're after the central banks. Mm-hmm. They're going to take them down. And so the rich dad company is not, we're not after the central banks, we're after the school system. And our, and Richard always asks, why don't we teach about money at school? Well, there's a reason for that. If you don't know anything about money, you'll work for that fake dollar. And it's exactly as um, Robert Breedlove was talking about with Gresham's Law. Gresham's Law is when fake money or bad money comes into the system, it pushes good money out. But when fake money or bad money comes in, guys like Adolf Hitler come to power. So that's what that's why I write because I'm being a former Marine and all this. That's what I that's what I'm concerned about. So the rich dad company is a capitalist company. We want to take down that school system. We've got to start teaching kids about money, and we've got to have people like Robert Breed love keeping the central banks honest. So thank you all for listening to the Rich Dad Radio Show. It's been a great time, great day. And let's most most of all, stay educated, keep an open mind. Thank you very much.